Welcome everyone. This is Debbie Maybear with National Kitchen and Bath Association. You're here for a second webinar of the month on sustainable design and everything this month is sponsored by Gebert. So we'd like to thank Gebert for their sponsorship. Today's session is called Water Savings with Every Flush, Improving Water Conservation in High Performance Buildings. Richard Rossi, who is the Business Development Manager with Niagara Corporation and Holly Shale, uh, who is the channel marketing manager. They're with us today. Richard is our main presenter. And Richard, we are ready to get started. So I'm going to ask you to unmute your line. And we're ready to go. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you, Debbie, for the very kind introduction and the good conversation heading into the educational part of the presentation today. Really appreciate it. And thanks also for allowing us to be a presenter. And thanks to our sponsor today as well for making this uh, happen. Uh, so really appreciate you guys from wherever you are tuning in from, uh, tuning in for this presentation and appreciate your interest in the, what we're going to talk about today. Um, as you can see here, and let me go ahead and uh, shut my video off. I just wanted everybody to see that I'm not a young spring chicken. I got a lot of gray hair here, so, but I don't want to distract you all from the presentation itself. So I'm going to go ahead, and stop my video, but, um, Welcome to uh, engage with us in any way that you feel appropriate on the on the other end here. So, um, so thanks again for tuning in. Uh, the title of the course today is "Water Savings with Every Flush: Improving Water Conservation in High Performance Buildings." Um, I just want to touch on Niagara real quickly in a bit of history before we get into the education part of the presentation. Niagara was founded in 1977 in New Jersey actually, uh, actually in a garage of uh, the owner of the company, Bill Cutler, created uh, some technology and a water saving shower head and uh, initially sold that to the utility companies in New Jersey, really pushing the water conservation movement back in the later 70s before it was really fashionable. One of the things we're going to talk about in the presentation today is gallons per flush on the toilet fixture and back then toilets were flushing at pretty much seven gallons of water per flush pretty amazing we're going to talk about a technology that today that allows a powerful flush yet quiet flush um, and very effective flush performance with only 0 0.8 eight tenths of a gallon of water so it's pretty amazing where we've come and we're gonna address that in the presentation today. So, um, but uh, Niagara has been in business since 77 and um, we really base everything we do with the plumbing fixtures that we manufacture on innovation and technology. So some of which we're, we are going to talk about today, which is the importance of the technology that's actually in tank type toilets. You know, when you look at a toilet like this, and you see this on the screen, you're going to see a trapway, you're going to see a bowl, you're going to see a pedestal. Um, toilets in a tank, toilets look basically the same from the outside, They're made of vitreous china or porcelain. But uh, the inner workings of the toilet and what creates the power of the flush is really important when you're specifying toilets on your project or you're purchasing toilets for your project or your home. So we're gonna talk about the, the toilet fixture itself today. We're gonna to talk about the fact that, and, and I'll show you some documentation that the toilet is the largest indoor water user, uses the most water of any fixture or appliance that uses water in your home on average. So that toilet fixture can really use a lot of water. People don't realize that. We flush our toilets on average five times per day. So um, per person that is. So um, it's pretty amazing how much water the toilet uses. A lot of people think the shower or your faucets maybe have uh, used more water, but your indoor water is really used um, in the largest part by your toilet. So we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about the technology, as I mentioned, that's in the tank, but we're gonna talk about you know, as, that, as the GPF of toilets progressed and lowered over time and innovation in the toilet fixture has taken place, the performance of the toilet has become that much more critical. You know, there, there was a time when low flow toilets first came into fashion and were being used in the United States at 
1.6 gallons per flush. And there was a very big consumer uprising against low flow fixtures. Um, all of the toilet's performance um, and how it uses water is really related to what's inside this tank right here. So keep that in mind as we're moving forward with the presentation. The other things we're going to discuss today is just water conservation in general, the supply and demand for water, what a finite resource water is on this planet. Um, and then we're gonna talk about some of the design features um, in the tank type toilet and the technology, of course, it's in the tank. Um, and the other thing we're going to address is the testing of toilets for gallons per flush, but more importantly, for the performance of the toilet. How effective is that toilet every time you flush it at removing waste from the bowl and, uh, and, and sending it into the plumbing system, which is what a toilet does, obviously. So um, this is the CEU information on this course today. Hopefully you can all see that. And uh, Debbie will be handling all the uh, certification um, for the uh, education credits. Um, some of these learning objectives I have gone over, um, we are going to, in addition to what I've already discussed, we're going to talk about water use and why it is fundamentally different than energy use. Uh, <clears throat> you know, energy, it, designing and building our building sustainably and our home sustainably is really important. Energy use has been a big factor over the years. You know, how efficient in energy is at home? Well, water is becoming that. Uh, issue now. It really is. People are starting to realize how important water conservation is within your home and how important it is to have a water, effic water efficiency in buildings. And we're going we're gonna to discuss that and uh, why it is that energy and water are different. Um, you know, common in the sense that the goal of sustainability is there, but, but uh, different in the way they are used. Um, as I mentioned, water efficiency and the, uh, the operational performance of the toilet is very important. So we're going to look at uh, testing and some labeling that goes on toilet fixtures to indicate how water efficient and how, uh, how a good a flush performance they have. Um, and then we are going to talk about uh, specifying the appropriate um, toilet for um, residential and commercial projects. So we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between residential and commercial plumbing. Um, I've already gone into the uh, history of Niagara and why we exist as a company, um, but without sacrificing comfort, and we expect when you use a water-saving fixture, be it a shower head, be it an aerator, be it a water-saving toilet, that it works when you use it. That is really important. You don't, you should not have to flush your toilet multiple times, whether it's using 1.6 gallons of water, whether it was using seven gallons of water back in the day, or whether it's using eight tenths of a gallon of water, which is one of the technologies we'll talk about today, all about the performance of the product. Uh, this is me, my tie days. Um, I am Western Devel Devel uh, Business Development Manager, so I cover all of Western US and all of Texas. I mentioned earlier, I'm based in Austin, Texas. Um, a lot of my focus is on multifamily residential projects and hospitality projects as well. But really just gaining a deeper knowledge of the technology that's in toilet fixtures and how important that is. And also, as we're gonna talk about in this slide, the importance of water conservation. Um, one of the reasons I love my job so well, as I do, is that I feel like I'm doing something a little bit toward saving the planet every day when I wake up. I talk about water conservation every day. The fact is that water is very prevalent on this planet. 70% of the planet's makeup is water, of the surface of the earth is water but only 1% of that water is able to be used for human consumption. That kind of blows me away every time I say it, but um, it's true. And that is not just for, you know, domestic home use. I mean, that's for agricultural use, commercial use, industrial use, environmental needs, et cetera. So water is absolutely a very, very finite resource on this planet. We need to keep that in mind as we're using it in various ways you know, statistically, it's interesting, the uh, water consumption on our planet has 
tripled uh, or has, yeah, has tripled over the last 50 years, but population has only doubled. So we are using water in ways that, you know, I don't even think we realize how we're using water. We come to expect when we turn our faucets on, flush our toilets, whatever, there's going to be water there. Um, so many countries aren't as lucky as we are in many areas of the globe. And we're going to look at water conservation um, domestically, and we're going to look at it globally as well. And the other factor really to consider is the cost of water and sewer and the aging infrastructure that is hap that moves water and sewer in this country. Um, a lot of it is in disrepair. A lot of it is requiring upgrading. And um, that is will add additional cost to water and sewer. As you, I'm sure, know, most of those costs, if not all of those costs, are going to be passed on to the consumer, the developer, the owner, the homeowner, uh, whoever that is that ends up paying that water bill ultimately. So the fact is that over the last 12 years, after the last dozen years or so, water and sewer rates have risen on average five to 6% per year. So the cost of water is very significant and something that we need to pay attention to. And the disrepair of the infrastructure that moves water and sewer is very important. None of that's gonna get better. It's all gonna be very costly. Um, so water scarcity, I mentioned, we're gonna look at a couple of maps here. The map on the left, you may have seen in the past, it's a US drought monitor map. It comes out once a week, every Thursday, actually. Uh, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln puts this out, publishes this. And this is just a way, as, you, as we all know, uh, droughts are, are movable and changeable. Um, there's some areas of the country that don't get very much average rainfall per year. I used to live in Las Vegas and um, in Henderson, Nevada, and we got you know four or five inches of rain a year there. Definitely a desert arid climate. Down here in central Texas, where I live now, we get a good average rainfall per year, but we go through very significant periods of eight weeks or longer, which is without rain at all, which is considered to be a drought condition. So what this USDM map does and why it comes out every week is just because, you know, we don't have any control over mother nature and when, you know, how much water we're going to get delivered from mother, from mother nature from the sky. But uh, so the droughts are very, um, very movable and changeable. And uh, this is just a way for utilities and others to anticipate um, extreme and exceptional drought conditions or abnormally dry conditions. So um, I actually see this map on our weather report uh, pretty much every Thursday they look at it. Um, so it's very interesting. Um, the water stress by country map that you see uh, on the right here just indicates it's a very good indicator of where we are going to be in the next 20 some years with um, water availability on this planet. And you can see there's a pretty darn significant amount of the globe that is in the high to extremely high category of ratio of withdrawals to supply of water. And this study was done based on various socioeconomic conditions, climate change, population growth, et cetera. But the point being, 20 years from now, well, 19 now, I guess, 2040, <laughs> that uh, you know, we're still going to be dealing with water shortages on this planet. So what we're going to talk about today are water efficiency programs, one of those of which is using water efficient fixtures in homes and buildings. The, um, that, those are long-term solutions as opposed to a drought resiliency plan, which is kind of a, a restriction on watering. Um, you know, like outdoor watering and, and water use in general um, to solve short term, you know, uh, droughts and things like that where we're not getting enough rain during a certain period. But the water efficiency programs like using water efficient fixtures and toilet fixtures in your home um, is something that's going to save water for future generations. And you all did see how much gray hair I have at the beginning of the presentation. I got kids and I don't have grandkids yet, but Maybe they're coming, but um, I really want to make an effort to save water for future generations. We don't know what's gonna be left on this planet. So it's important to do what we can now. Um, so residentially, we use, the EPA has done a lot of studies on how we use water. <clears throat> and this is a, a chart showing uh, the various indoor fixtures that use water and indoor appliances. But 
one of the studies that the EPA water sense has done is that we use on average 88 gallons of water per person per day. Pretty mind blowing. Think about 88 gallons. I, you know, I look at myself, I'm like, oh, there's no way I use 88 gallons of water a day myself. But on average, we do. And toilet flushing frequency on average, and I did mention this briefly earlier in the presentation, is five flushes per day. Um, I get this question a lot in this business. And uh, there have been studies that the EPA has done. We do flush our toilets per person average five times per day. So um, pretty amazing. And um, the leaks that come from toilet fixtures are another thing I want to point out here. You can see that on average 24%, about a quarter of your water in your home, internal, in, indoor, uh, in your home indoors is used by your toilet. But half of the leaks or roughly half of the leaks that come from any fixtures or appliances within your home come from the toilet. And many of those are attributable to the flapper style technology that's inside that toilet tank. So we are gonna talk about gravity fed toilets and how they work with flapper. Um, the flapper is one of those technologies that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat imperfect. Um, it, they can leak, your toilet can leak without you even knowing it's leaking. Um, you can test that by putting food coloring or some type of water coloring in your tank and see if that leaks into your bowl. That means your flapper is leaking. So, um, and they are a high maintenance item as well. So just something to, to pay attention to when we're talking about the technology that's actually creating the power of the flush in a toilet. Um, in multifamily, it's interesting. I think in most major markets you will see, and I know here in Austin, Texas, you know, we are lucky enough, knock on wood, to have a uh, very healthy growing economy here. There's a lot of multifamily construction going on. Um, the fact is one third of our population in the United States lives in multifamily buildings now. So, and that is continuing to grow in most major urban markets. There's a lot of cranes in the air. Um, I was just down in San Antonio <clears throat> earlier this week. There's a lot of cranes in the air in San Antonio as well. So, um, and it does benefit, water conservation benefits owners and using water efficient fixtures, whether they're paying the water bill or not. You know, if the tenant is paying the water bill on a, on a submetered property, um, you know, they have, they, they have that incentive, right? To, to save water. It actually, if the water bills are higher and the utility costs are higher in that unit, it really inhibits the owner of the building from raising the rent in the building. You now that money's going elsewhere. So it's of benefit to the owner if they're paying the water bill, certainly that's, what, that's money right back in their pocket, but it's also a benefit to provide water efficient and energy efficient fixtures in, in a tenant space. Um, that is becoming a, a real demand um, from the tenant. Now, there's a lot of competition out there in multifamily. So um, it is important uh, for the owner to consider the type of fixtures and how much water they use, but also, you know, very importantly, how well that fixture works um, to save water. And the toilet still flushes. The last thing an owner wants is complaints about toilets not flushing properly. So um, anyway, and then tiered rate structures, I wanted to point out here as well. We pro we're probably all familiar with those where you get an adder on your bill when you go over a certain amount of gallons used in your billing cycle. And then there's usually another level. When you go over another level of use per month. So keeping down on those lower tiers will also keep water and sewer costs down um, in your home and down on the property itself. So I mentioned earlier commercial buildings. Commercial and institutional buildings account for 17% of water withdrawals from public US water supplies. It's pretty darn significant. And in all of those facilities, except for restaurants, which will have a kitchen facility, obviously, use water in that, the largest percentage of water use in those facilities is the domestic restroom use. So those toilets do deliver the, heart, the highest ROI of any um, other uh, water use within that building. So keep that in mind when you're looking at uh, changing out toilets perhaps in an older building um, from a, a higher GPF to lower GPF product. So 
This is the slide that I talked about earlier about energy and water efficiency and how they're similar and how they're different. I think we all know how they're similar. You know, energy and water efficiency is really important um, to save energy costs, reduce costs, um, and save water for future generations as well and to save the cost of water too. But the big difference between energy and water is that water can be used, collected, treated, and reused. So that's really important. And it also takes energy to treat water. So by using water efficient toilets and water efficient fixtures, less water is required to be treated. So thus you're saving energy as well when you're delivering water back to a building. So that's pretty significant. We'll look at some numbers that were published by WaterSense a little bit later in the presentation. And we'll talk about how much how many dollars, you know, how many gallons of water, but then how many dollars have been saved by the water sense label since its inception in early 2007. Uh, so we're going to get into the, some real, you know, kind of simple stuff as far as toilets go, but y'all may or may know, not know about it. Um, for instance, what a toilet is made out of um, in very common in, in toilets that are used in buildings and homes. Um, that aren't, aren't like outdoors and stadiums and things like that um, are going to be made out of porcelain or vitreous china. Um, in the industry, we call it vitreous china. And uh, the reason is it's very easy to form into shapes. It's, it's resistant to chemicals. It's resistant to water, scratching and things like that. So um, it's, a, it's a very, you know, uh, lends itself well to, to forming toilets out of it. Um, but the fully glazed ceramic in that toilet is also very important. As unglazed ceramic can make the toilet less efficient anywhere where water comes into contact with the ceramic material um, in this bowl and in the trapway where the water is flowing. Um, the fully glazed ceramic adds to the efficiency. And the other thing it does, it provides for a cleaner bowl after use. Um, so a lot of people don't realize how, how important a flu, fully glazed ceramic material is in the manufacturing of toilets. Um, various configurations of toilets we're going to look at in this slide. Um, the one-piece toilet, which you see here on the left, is just that. It's got a tank and a bowl that are formed into one piece. Uh, sometimes plumbers don't like this toilet as well because it's a bit heavier and harder to set, maybe, than a two-piece toilet. A two-piece toilet, you're going to set the bowl, and then you're going to put the tank on the bowl in most cases. So it's a two-piece toilet with the tank attached to the bowl with fittings. Um, and then I just want to point out some basic things about the toilet fixture itself. This is the pedestal that raises the toilet to a proper height. And we're going to talk about heights on the next slide and how those have changed over the years. The height of the toilet fixture has changed. Uh, more comfort height now. And then the shape of the bowl. Um, there are round bowl toilets, which are generally used for space saver in a bathroom. To uh, it's going to take up less space, um, so it is going to allow you know if your door is going to swing out tight to the to the front of the toilet, a round bowl is a great application. Elongated bowls, which you see here on the left, are preferred for comfort and ADA compliance as well. And then this toilet here on the right is a rear outlet toilet. So you can see this trapway, which is the path, the exit path in essence from the bowl to the plumbing system, which moves the waste and the water from the bowl to the plumbing system. Um, this has an extra loop in the trapway if the plumbing is uh, in the wall, although this is still a, a floor mounted unit. There are also becoming more popular all wall mounted toilets as well or they're just hanging off the wall. So they're really easy to clean underneath. So that's becoming a popular type of toilet as well. Um, the heights of toilets I mentioned have, has changed over the years. We used to be making toilets at 14 to 15 inches in height. And it's amazing what just these couple inches will do. Most toilets now are made at 16 inches from the floor to the uh, front edge of the bowl without the seat um, or 17 inches. Um, that is now considered 17 to 19 inches with the seat as considered an ADA, American Disabilities Act, uh, uh, compliant toilet as far as the height goes. The other factors in ADA are the accessibility of the flush handle and how much pressure it takes to, to push that flush handle down. So 
So these are considered to be comfort height toilets, more like a chair height, easy to sit down and uh, get up off of compared to those toilets that were two inches shorter um, that, uh, that used to be manufactured. So most toilets you're gonna see are gonna be 16 to 17 inches now off the, off the, uh, from the floor to the edge of the bowl. And then the rough end dimension is the last thing I wanted to mention here on the slide. That is the dimension from the wall not including any molding or baseboards that may be on the floor to the center of the flange bolts where the toilet or where the trapway exits into the plumbing system. So a couple of common dimensions are 10 inch and 12 inch. And you'll see those, you see those here on this slide. So I mentioned trapways, I'll fly through this slide. This is a uh, exposed or open trapway. You can see it, right? It's a little bit harder to clean around it and things like that. Um, so some people prefer this enclosed or concealed trapway toilet. Um, the toilet still obviously has the exit path. It has the trapway, but it's hidden. Um, so these toilets do run a little bit more usually because there's more porcelain to them, but there's always going to be access for the plumber to attach this toilet to the floor. And there's a little pop out door, um, that, uh, where the, where the plumber can place that toilet and, um, and mount it to the, bolt it to the floor. The flush handle positioning has changed over the years. I'm sure some of you all realize. Um, very common is the swing lever still. And that can be on the fronts of the, the front left and right side of the tank, or it can be on the actual sides of the tank. Um, the top flush button is becoming more and more popular. Um, this is a single top flush button, and that is on the top of the tank lid of the tank type toilet. This on the left is a dual flush mechanism. So these are really cool for saving water in addition to um, in addition to like a regular single flush toilet. So what you can do with a dual flush toilet is you can half volume flush, the half volume of water for a liquid flush, liquid waste flush, but you can full flush for a solid waste flush. So what is done in these cases is there's an average gallon per flush. Um, so it's two liquid flushes to one solid waste flush, and that is your average flush. So great way to save water. Um, needs to really be a user-friendly button um, because a lot of buttons, at least that I've tried, sometimes you don't know if you're single or double, double flushing. So a user-friendly dual flush button really does help save water. Um, you can really get that flush volume down like with a 0.8 toilet, you can get that flush volume down to 0 0.6, 0 0.65 on average with your toilet, which is, you know, just over a half gallon, which is pretty cool. So uh, we're going to talk now about the uh, GPF. We're going to uh, get into as the presentation moves forward, flush technologies and uh, toilet design. You know, not only is it important to look at what's inside this tank as far as what generates the power of the flush, uh, but it's also important to, to look at how this bowl is designed and how water is used to keep the bowl clean and finish the flush. The next couple of slides we're gonna look at are just related to a couple of regulatory agencies that test and certify toilets in the US. And I'll keep this very global in nature for this presentation, just very 30,000 foot view here, but um, ask, ask me is the, um, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Um, this is the standard that all toilets sold in the US must comply with, A112.19.2, um, and then a separate standard for dual flush toilet equipment in the US. And ask me, um, we'll do the uh, testing and certification um, for these toilets. And then on this book, oh, on this slide, I will also mention IATMO, the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, and they will test and certify toilets for safe and efficient water use in commercial and residential buildings. So they will do testing um, for the drain line carry on a toilet. Um, they'll do testing uh, and certification for uh, ADA compliance as well, compliance with the A117.1-2017, the uh, American Disabilities Act. So. Um, so on we go, water sense label. I hope you guys have heard of the water sense label here, especially y'all that are here in the US. Um, 
The water sense label has helped Americans save 3.4 trillion gallons of water since its inception back in late 06, early 07, and 84.2, I'm quoting exactly, uh, a billion dollars in energy and water cost. Pretty darn significant amount of money and water saved by this label. So, and we'll talk about why this label was created by the federal government, by the EPA, but this is a voluntary program, right? So the, so the manufacturer can submit their toilet for certification for this label voluntarily. They, don't, they aren't mandated to do so. Um, but the toilet has to use, to get this label, it has to use 20% less water than a standard model. So that is 1.28 gallons per flush or a high efficiency toilet. It needs to be a high efficiency toilet. Uh, 1.6 being a standard model, 1.6 gallons per flush. Um, needs to save energy, and I mentioned why that is on the earlier slide. Um, and also perform as well or better than regular models. So that's what a lot of people don't realize. I don't think about the water sense label. They think about it as a um, saving water only. Um, but it's all about the performance of the toilet. This is one of the first standards that was created or labels that was created for the toilet fixture that um, created, that, that mandated in essence, if you want to get this label and have your toilet tested, a, a amount of grams that the toilet has to re remove of solid waste in a single flush. And that is 350 grams. And we'll look at a little history of toilet performance and uh, how the, some of these uh, some of these rating systems were developed in a later slide. But um, this slide, I'm just going to really you know just skim over lead here. But I want to mention that lead, NGBS, Green Globes, many of the uh, the um, sustainability uh, certifications um, that many of us are trying to achieve in our buildings and, and perhaps in our homes as well. Um, Points can be added for with uh, high efficiency HE toilets at 1.28 or UHG ultra high efficiency toilets at one gallon or under, which is what the 0.8 technology would be. So a UHG toilet. So that will definitely help with building certifications. Um, one of the things with LEED before in particular, the WE category, all newly installed fittings and fixtures must have that water sense label that I just talked about from the federal government. Um, in order to qualify for use in a um, LEED V4 WE rated um, building, certified building. So um, we're gonna do another presentation um, that probably will come out later this year. It's gonna be a little bit more related to green building standards. So um, hopefully we'll get that out there so more people can learn about that. Um, so this is the, uh, about halfway through here, this is a quick quiz. Um, Holly, I don't know. I'm not even looking at the chat to tell you the truth, but if anybody wants to take a stab at this, this is kind of an interesting question, which will prompt some discussion in the next uh, couple of slides. Of all toilets installed in the U.S., how much water do you think is used in, on average for the flush? And what do you think the average GPF is for all toilets that are currently installed in the U.S.? Less than a container of milk or less than a gallon? A little bit more than a gallon, like a fishbowl size? or a fish tank, three to five gallons. And I don't know if we're able to interact or anybody wants to talk to sure. me, but cool. We're, we're getting some, some answers in. We've got a fish tank, fish bowl, fish tank, um, another fish tank answer. Nice. Good, it's good More to see- fish tank. Nice. Yes. It's, it's good to see people participating in this. I'm excited, this is cool. Um, you know, when you're doing this in a room and you see people, it's a lot easier to see their reaction and how they're, how they're reacting. But thank you so much for participating in this little quiz. And thanks, Holly, for, uh, for uh, giving me the results. And you all that said a fish tank of water, y'all are correct. Um, it, and the point of this slide, obviously, in these couple of slides is there are still a lot of water guzzling toilets out on the market, three to five gallons. I've been on projects where toilets are using five gallons per flush current, you know, that, that where the owner is, is considering changing out to a 0.8 toilet or a lesser flow toilet um, and renovating the, the apartment units themselves, um, including the fixtures. Um, I, five gallons is 
fairly common still. Three and a half gallons, pretty common. Amazing that there's toilets that flush with that much water. When technology exists to flush effectively at 1.28 or less and under one gallon or less. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, so this slide sort of reiterates that point. Um, I've talked already about back in my teenage years when I was a youngin, um, toilets were flushing seven gallons per flush. Pretty mind blowing. When you look at where we are today with 1100 plus models of high efficiency toilets and ultra high efficiency toilets on the market that actually flush better than those toilets did in the past because technology has changed in your toilet fixture. We always think about, you know, the technology that's in our phones and things like that that allow us to carry our phones in our pockets. We don't really think that the toilets changed over the years as well. Kind of looks very similar, but um, what's inside that toilet, the technology has really changed a lot. And much of this, and I, I won't read all this to you, but um, toilets used to flush at three and a half, seven gallons. And then it was, you know, back in the middle, middle 80s or so, it was three and a half gallons. There was a point in time when water conservation in the early 90s really became very popular. States started to mandate water conservation standards. The feds did as well. And uh, suddenly we were looking at toilets that were being manufactured at three and a half gallons per flush at that time. And many manufacturers modified the, the tank trim in those toilets and just reduced that flush volume by half without making any other changes to the toilet and the design of the toilet and how water is used in the toilet. Some of you may remember back in the early 90s, there was quite a consumer uprising in the US of A about the <laughs> poor performance of toilets. So uh, these toilets were not working well. They just, they, they were not designed to work with 1.6 gallons of water. They were designed to work with three and a half gallons of water. So. That's when the EPA and the federal government started mandating some standards for the performance of the toilet, right? So, gosh, you know, great that we're saving water and toilets are flushing at 1.6, but people are flushing them two, three, four times just to get them to actually work. So voluntary flush ratings started to be tested. The number of grams that a toilet will remove in a single flush, grams of solid waste. The first standard was the EPA <clears throat> Act 92, 250 grams of waste mandated uh, but along with your 1.6 gallons per flush. Again, I keep saying mandated, but voluntary, but in order to get this, this uh, rating, the toilet had to be tested to 250 grams uh, of waste removal minimum um, in a laboratory environment. And that is actually done with, uh, with soybean paste or miso paste and toilet paper mixed together packed into prophylactics actually, and weighed out and flushed till the toilet fails. And that's how the toilet is tested in a laboratory environment to simulate real world conditions uh, to get these labels. I've already gone through water scents. One of the only thing I wanna point out here that, that was, you know, um, what roughly 10 years later, uh, the EPA launched water scents. You can see where the gallons per flush is on these toilets to get the water sense label. And now you're having to flush 350 grams versus 250 grams of solid waste. Um, so performance standards started to be adopted for toilets at that time, um, during that time. And a lot of it was related to the poor performance of those 1.6 gallon toilets. Um, Back in 2003, even before water sense was initiated, and for the same reasons, MAP was created, a maximum performance scale for your toilet. There's a website called map-testing.com that is pretty interesting, map-testing.com. Um, that's where you can find the MAP score of toilets and various other uh, features of toilets. You can actually compare various manufacturers of toilets and models and, and look at their map scoring and things like that. So, and then the map premium label actually, um, and you know, I did mention how the toilets are tested, but that's ex exactly what the map score is here, right? Number of grams of solid waste the toilet can remove from a fixture in a single flush, tested in the laboratory to failure of the toilet, not being able to flush that amount of grams. The map premium label came out in 2012, and that's another label that a toilet can get in addition to the water sense label. So 
In order to get that label though, the toilet has to have the EPA certification, the water sense certification, number one. It's got to flush with less than 1.06 gallons of water. So basically a gallon and under. And it's got to remove 600 grams of waste in a single flush. That's 170% of the water sense requirement for a toilet. So pretty significant demand on a toilet. And uh, this just indicates where we were and where we are as far as performance standards go on toilets. Back when a 1.6 gallon per flush toilet began to, to show up in the marketplace here in the US, and there was no federal standard for the toilet performance whatsoever. And where we are now with a performance standard with the MAP premium uh, rated standard, 600 grams of waste with only 1.05 gallons of water. So we have come a long way as far as how toilets work and how effectively they remove waste in a single flush. Um, just a couple of quick drain line studies and then I'm gonna get into the technology portion of the presentation. Oops, my bad there. Um, so PERC and MAP both did studies about the same time, uh, 2015, 2016 time, uh, four or five years ago, uh, related to commercial drain lines and, and, and residential drain lines and whether it is appropriate to spec under one gallon toilets in a commercial environment, in a commercial building, the same as it would be in a residential building. And both studies came to very similar conclusions that it is not recommended necessarily to spec one gallon per flush toilets in a commercial application because of long drain lines and the do not have the presence of additional long duration water flows to continue moving solid waste down the drain lines. No, I want to uh, be clear here, no toilet can completely remove all solid waste from the drain line. There's always going to be particulate matter that's going to be left behind. It's the, the presence of the other long duration water flows in a building um, like a hotel, like a multi-residential building of all types um, that are gonna have showers, uh, faucets, kitchen and bath, water using appliances in many cases, like a dishwasher or a clothes washer. All of that additional water source is going to continue to move the solid waste down the drain lines. The other thing about commercial drain lines is they are larger in diameter generally. The pipe slope um, from the building to the main uh, plumbing line is going to be uh, shallower usually, and the pipe runs are longer. The other thing in commercial buildings is that they, the toilets get abused a bit more than they would normally in a residential building. Toilet seat covers and things like that get flushed down. But all that said, in most cases, new construction can accommodate ultra high efficiency toilets without a problem. So, um, but um, all, an engineer, a plumbing and mechanical engineer could take a look at the existing plumbing and recommend whether a toilet would be appropriate for that uh, that building with the current plumbing in the building. So flush technologies, um, we're gonna get into um, what you see inside that tank of the tank type toilet and how it actually generates the power of the flush and how the toilets that are on the marketplace today are different. Um, uh, first of all, I wanna just touch on cleaning the bowl, which I mentioned earlier, a fully, fully glazed ceramic, anywhere where the toilet uh, comes into contact with water in the bowl and where the water is and waste are moving through the trapway is really important. And it's very important in the bowl to keep that bowl clean. One of the things with low flow toilets that we've seen over the years, and uh, we're gonna talk about why that's different with um, some of the technologies, the usually with a low flow toilet, because there's less water being used in the flush, the water spot here, like I'm kind of showing you with my arrow here on the right, is much lower in the bowl. Um, the vacuum assist toilet that we're going to talk about at the end of the presentation that effectively flushes with 0 0.8 gallons, it actually has compressed air in the trapway of the toilet. What is that? And that is forced down through an air, what's called an air transfer tube uh, from the, uh, from the uh, flush chamber uh, to the trapway of the toilet. So you can see when this toilet is ready to be flushed, it's got a water spot down here in a water spot here in between is pressurized air. What that does with this particular toilet is it pushes the water spot up in the bowl. Thus, it has a six inch by eight inch water spot or pretty darn large landing area 
in the toilet, which also assists with keeping the bowl clean. So that's important to look at when you're looking at flush technologies, especially with an ultra high efficiency or high efficiency toilets. Um, the toilets we're gonna look at today are gravity fed, pressure assist. Um, we're gonna look at a gravity assist uh, flush flapperless. And then we're going to look at the vacuum assist technology. And we think that covers a pretty good gamut of the technologies that are out there in tank type toilets right now. So uh, the gravity fed toilet is a very common toilet been around for years. Um, this is a pretty common toilet you may see in a hotel um, and other buildings as well. But basically the concept is, and the reason it's called gravity fed is because it's gravity and the weight of the water that are kind of create the power of the flush in this toilet, right? So you're gonna hit this flush handle. It's gonna lift up some type of rubber flapper mechanism of some type that's sealing the water off in the tank from going into the bowl. And at that point, it's gravity and the weight of water that are gonna force the flush. That is where the power of the flush is coming from. It's a technology that uses water to push the waste from the bowl through the trapway into the plumbing system. I think you guys are probably all familiar with this type of toilet. It's gonna to completely drain the tank of water um, uh, every time you flush. A pressure assist toilet is oftentimes mistaken for a vacuum assist toilet. They are different. They both use air and water. The pressure assist toilet uses air on top of the water at the cylinder that's within the tank to force the water even faster. So here you've got gravity and the weight of the water creating the power of the flush. Here you've got some compressed air that's forcing that water faster into the bowl and through the trapway to create the power of the flush. You see these toilets a lot in hotels. They are quite loud. People get a lot of complaints about these and they splash. I mean, these are the type of toilets you know when you flush them. Um, they're definitely a louder uh, flush, but it's still using that water in the air to force it to push. The, it's still a push technology in essence. <clears throat> Pardon me. So it is creating the power of the flush through pushing water um, into the system and through that trapway into the plumbing system. This is a gravity fed toilet with flapper here on the left with this cutaway. I think this is a pretty common toilet. If you guys are homeowners out there that are listening, you probably have changed the flappers out on your toilets, probably more than once. Um, the flapper can wear and tear. It is fully submerged in water, this toilet. Again, when this gravity fed toilet operates, it's gonna use this chain mechanism that's hooked to the handle. It's gonna lift that flapper up. Water's gonna flow from the tank into the bowl creating the power of the flush because of gravity and the weight of water. And then the flapper is gonna close as the toilet is refilling. <clears throat> and then the toilet will drain completely the next time it's flush. So point being the flapper is high maintenance. Um, if the flapper is replaced, generally you're gonna go to the hardware store and get a non OEM flapper from the, you know, like a red corky or whatever. Um, that could be using much more water, up to three times more water than what the toilet is actually rated for. When you look at a toilet, you're going to see a, a GPF usually uh, stamped here. And also, I know a lot of people don't even, you know, lift up the tank of their tank lid off their toilet until there's a problem with it. That's not working properly. But usually it's stamped here on the inside of the, of the uh, tank as well. And then uh, gravity assist with flapper. The cool thing about this toilet is it is flapperless in design. There is no rubber flapper here. All of the water is contained in this tip bucket. And what happens when you flush it is the, the bucket tips when the handle is pushed down, then gravity takes effect. So that's why it's called a gravity assist and it does not have a flapper. So it is gonna have a 360 degree water flow from the tank to the bowl. That also helps with the efficiency of the toilet. These toilets are 1.28 gallons per flush, so they are a um, high efficiency or an HE toilet. So the vacuum assist is what we'll conclude with today. This technology is pretty darn cool. It can take the, uh, the uh, flush volume down to 0.8 or on a dual flush technology. Pardon me, a dual flush technology is gonna take it down, could take it to 0.5 or 0.8, uh, 0.8 on the solid flush, 0.5 on the liquid flush and still get a powerful, effective flush. And this is why. The air transfer tube that I mentioned earlier, and this is what the flush chamber looks like inside the tank. Um, it is connected to the vitreous china, to the trapway of the toilet. Um, this toilet 
this tank cannot be retrofitted on a standard toilet bowl because it works in conjunction with the movement of the air through from the trapway to the air transfer tube and then being forced back into the trapway again before the toilet is ready to flush again. I already, and I'll go through the next couple of slides to show you in a little bit more detail what's unique about these toilets and how they work. There are videos online you can check out as well um, on this, uh, this technology, this vacuum assist. The larger water surface I've already mentioned because this air displaces the water, it's gonna push that water spot up in the bowl. So unusually large water surface to help that bowl clean for a um, low flow or an ultra high efficiency toilet. Um, bowl design is important when you're talking about cleaning the bowl. Um, these toilets, because the power of the flush is created in the trapway here behind the toilet, the tank never completely drains of water and they're using 0 0.8 gallons. So it's important to be able to utilize that water effectively to do two things. Finish the flush, which is the power of the flush really comes from the pull force created in the trapway in these toilets and to clean the bowl. So cleaning systems are important. Um, these type of toilets have a rim jet in the front, which is gonna force water directly down into the trapway when the toilet is flushed. They have a siphon jet at the bottom of the bowl, which is going to force water directly into the trapway of the toilet. And they have a rim wash system around the edge of the bowl. All of this, of course, you can't see um, when, the, uh, when you purchase your toilet. It's all under the rim of the bowl. But these cleaning systems are really important to effectively use the 0.8 gallons of water to finish the flush and clean the bowl. The fill valve on these toilets are a very common plumbing part, a fluid master part. Um, but the fill valve, because this tank never completely drains and it's only the water in the cylinder that's used in the flush, the post flush level is only a couple inches below the pre flush level. Therefore, like a typical, typical gravity fed toilet, which I showed you earlier, a couple different models of that. Um, this tank never drains, although the water is recycled in the tank. So they consequently, they refill quite quickly and uh, the fill valve will remain submerged. It fills from the bottom. Most fill valves fill from the top. So this is a very, very quiet refill as well because it is insulated with the water around it. Um, and these next two slides will just show you with green and blue, green being the air movement, uh, water being the blue, the blue um, how water and air are used in these toilets when they flush. And again, I won't read through all this. You feel free to, to read through it. Um, but basically what happens with these toilets is when water is filling the, the tank, there's air in this flush cylinder. It is con fully contained in the cylinder. It has nowhere to go but down the air transfer tube. So as the water is filling up in the bowl or in the tank, it's forcing air down into the trapway of the toilet, creating a pressurized trapway. It's this siphonic action in the toilet and the, the uh, removal of this air back up into the air transfer tube when the flush handle is, is uh, pushed and the toilet flushes, that is going to create this movement and this pull effect, the vacuum in the trapway. That's why they're called vacuum assist. So uh, contrary to all the other toilets I've showed you today, the tank type toilets I've showed you, this toilet, the power of the flush is created right here, in the trapway of the toilet. It's a pull effect. You actually can see the water in the bowl move in these toilets before the water in, from the tank enters the bowl. That's that vacuum pull. That's where the power of the flush comes from. And that is why 0.8 gallons is very sufficient, uh, plenty of water to create a powerful flush in these toilets um, and keep the bowl clean. This slide just indicates the uh, dual flush technology that is also vacuum assist. <clears throat> That's the one where I showed you that half plunger button um, where you can half flush for a liquid waste full flush for solid waste. Um, this uh, 
has an additional cylinder in it, which shuts off when the half flush plunger, plunger is pushed. Thus, it's only going to use 0.5 or half a gallon as opposed to the full uh, flush. It is a spring-loaded device, so it is gonna pop back up and at the end of the flush, and you're gonna be able to uh, use the full flush if you choose to on the next flush. So it's just the added additional cylinder, um, but still the same movement of air and water creating the power of the flush in this toilet as well. Um, cool though, with you know dual flush technology, like how much more water you can save on an annual basis. This is a study that was done on a three person household, which is considered to be average in the US. Uh, mentioned five flushes per day per person in that household. This is about what you would be using per year in your toilets based on this data, um, about almost 20,000 gallons of water if you were flushing at three and a half gallons per flush using one of those older toilets. And this is where you could be by utilizing the vacuum assist technology toilet. I mean, really you can save upwards of 20,000 gallons of water, enough to fill a good sized swimming pool in your backyard. So imagine if every family in the US was able to do this, um, that's living in a home, that would be pretty, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, there's some really significant savings that can be achieved um, with this flush volume. And if the toilet's performing well, you're not going to have to flush the toilet multiple times. So um, single flush works really well. A couple of case studies, and then I'm going to open it up to any Q&A we might have. Um, and these will be real quick. Both are renovation projects. Both owners actually were a little bit skeptical about using 0.8 toilets for the reasons I've already stated in this presentation, but very successful retrofits. Um, the owner of this project went on to do several other hotels with this technology. Um, the key was a sample of the toilet was installed on the property, worked really well, then they reno renovated 115 units. But you can see the type of savings that are possible, especially when you're out on those projects that have, you know, this type of flush volume on the toilet. I mean, this job was 55% reduction in 35 days on water use. Um, and $8,000 reduction in the water bill as well on the property. No complaints from the owners. Also a big plus, especially for a hotel hospitality type environment. Um, this happens to be another hospitality project. Um, the JW Marriott in Desert Springs uh, Resort in Palm Desert, California. I'm very familiar with this project, actually. My parents live pretty close to here in Southern California. But in any case, you can see the amount of savings. And the, the cool thing about this job, which I really like to point out, is the, the, uh, the financial assistance and the support that was provided by the Coachella Valley Water District in California and Palm Desert, who paid for half of the cost of the toilets uh, for Marriott. So um, this project saved 15 million gallons of water from the existing three and a half going to 0.8. Um, 900 hotel units in this retrofit was done in about two to three weeks. I think it took them about 20 some minutes per toilet um, to change out the, uh, the toilets in this building. So pretty significant water savings. We need to be more attentive to projects like this and uh, buildings that still have these three and a half gallon toilets in them and, and get, uh, get, the, uh, get the more water efficient toilets out there and into these type of projects saving more water for future generations. Um, the summary of what we talked about today, and thank you guys so much for your attendance. Um, the earth surface, a lot of water, only 1% though we can use. Um, I mentioned water efficiency programs and how important they are for long-term water savings, saving water for your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids and future generations that are gonna have this planet when we're long gone. Um, Toilet flushing is the largest indoor water use. Please keep that in mind. And what's inside that toilet, the technology of the toilet and how it uses water, really, really important to the, to the functionality of the toilet and the performance, but also you know for saving water as well. And then the various labels that are available, MAP Premium, WaterSense, remember that website, if you will, map-testing.com. Uh, pretty cool to understand what the MAP score of a toilet is. And um, that you could save a lot of water just by changing out your toilet fixtures to um, 
to 0.8 toilets in your homes. So thank you very much. Uh, this is all the information. I think that uh, that you guys um, uh, need. I think uh, Aspie, Aspie, this might be some old stuff, but anyway, thank you so much for attending the presentation today. Um, questions, I'm, I'm hey. done, Debbie, so thank okay. you. Richard, thank you so um, much. This has been so interesting. I learned cool, so glad. much about toilets today. I hope everyone in the audience did too. And I, I just, so I ha yeah, so I know it's just at the top of the hour, we have about six questions. Um, cool. I know that Serena's, uh, no, I'm sorry, I know that um, Holly's been answering them, but I wanted cool. to get them into the recording because not cool. everybody was able to see them. So Great. Serena, Thank you. Serena has a question and she said, can you choose a left or right hand lever on toilets? Yep. Um, okay. Great question. Great question. Yes. Um, and that is often a concern for ADA compliance. So yes, you can. Ch most toilets with the uh, that don't have the single top flush button that are going to be a flush handle that's going to be on the sides of the tank are manufactured as you're facing the toilet with the handle on the left side. But in many cases, for accessibility within a, a bathroom, the handle needs to be positioned on the right hand side. So uh, yes, there are toilet models that are available with left hand flush and right hand flush handles for that very reason. So that's a great question. Great, and then Jerry had a comment here. Um, uh, it, he says, with regard to the toilet seat height, please remind designers to consider the height of the clients. To those of us who are vertically challenged, <laughs> the comfort height is definitely not the classic 14 to 15 inch height. Is no doubt. <laughs> the classic 14 to 15 inch height is best, but increasingly hard to find. Yes, that is absolutely true. I mean, I think that's kind of more of a statement than, than a question, but yeah, absolutely. That is the case. Um, toilets are definitely, you know, one and a half, two inches taller than they really used to be, used to be. And it's noticeable. It's noticeable when you sit down on an older toilet and no matter what, you know, your height is, vertically challenged or not, it's definitely a noticeable difference between the higher toilet and the lower toilet. It's interesting that you mentioned that. I guess I'll, I'll throw my 90-year-old parents in here real quick. They're 90 plus and God bless them. And thank God they're still on the planet with us and with me. But um, but I know that they were like, when they found out I got into the toilet business, they were like, you're not selling those low toilets because we can't sit down and get up off of those things. We need a comfort high toilet. <laughs> and I said, yeah, there are, there, there are some that prefer the higher toilet and some prefer the lower, but, but you're correct. Um, they're harder to find. The, the 14 to 15 inch uh, toilets, uh, high toilets are, are much harder to find these days. Great, Thank, thanks for, yeah, thanks for commenting on that. So Lydia has a question. Do you know what percentage of toilets have moved to efficiency across the US versus the tank size toilet guzzlers? Good question. I don't know the percentage number but I will tell you, as we stated here in this presentation, there's still a lot of work to be done. It, it, it blows my mind sometimes when I go out to renovation projects and I haven't been out on job sites in quite some time, unfortunately, where normally I'd probably be on several job sites a week, but, um, but there's still a lot of water guzzlers out there. Um, I don't have a percentage number for you, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And it's amazing in older homes. You know, one thing I will point out is there are many utilities throughout the country. Um, here in Texas, the city of Dallas is pretty aggressive on the water conservation side. Um, they will actually um, get, they will give toilets away to folks that are more efficient based on a number of factors. You know, how old the home is, um, how many gallons per flush that toilet is, have they been replaced in the past, those kinds of things. The intent being, to take those three and a half gallon and up toilets out of there and get more water efficient toilets like 1.28 or 0.8 toilets in. So many utilities will incentivize customers, being homeowners, building owners, whatever it is, to replace their toilets with more water efficient models. And I think that is making a big impact. You know, it's the almighty dollar does talk. So, um, you know, when you incentivize somebody by giving them a rebate, or providing them with a free toilet under various circumstances for changing that out, that really does encourage um, water conservation to move forward. 
So ch check with your local utility, see what they're offering. That can change over time. You know, some, some programs will last five, 10, 20 years. Um, so many utilities are offering these type of rebates. So check with your local utility company where you pay your water bill and see if you have any rebates available. Okay, good. And then Sharon says, um, she says, great presentation. She says she's in California and the, yes. code, the code there is 1.28 GPF and dual yes. flush for remodel and new construction. She just yes. simply says more states need to do this. Absolutely. Cal Green. We love Cal Green. Um, yes. And, and I really do think California is on the, on the, on the front edge of water conservation. And I love it. The Texas is the same way. Uh, uh, it was Sharon, right? Um, te te Texas is the same way right now. We mandate, it's not part of our, well, actually, I believe it is part of our code. You, you cannot, in a new construction project, you have to install a high efficiency 1.28 or less. Uh, 1.6s are, are not allowed to be installed anymore. So you are so right. The water conservation movement is so important. More states need to pay attention to this and, um, you know, and, and, and start requiring those lower flow toilets to be installed in new construction. So Stephanie had that question about the incentives for people to switch to low flush toilets. Can you expand on that at any point? Yes. I mean, really, I would, I would tell you to, to reach out to your, your local utility. You know, I, I can I can talk about like city of Austin right now that I don't believe there's anything in place for the toilet fixture right now, but there are various uh, rebates in place for outdoor watering. But for a time, um, Austin had a very aggressive toilet replacement program. Um, I was just down in San Antonio. They're not currently offering uh, incentives, financial incentives for uh, toilet fixture replacement, but for 20 years. They supported that. 20 years, they were basically giving away toilets to people. You'd line up in the parking lot on a Saturday and grab a water efficient toilet, um, you know, as long as you were one of their customers. So, um, yeah, so I, I would, what, and I mentioned what, what's going on in the city of Dallas. Um, I would check with your local utility company, whoever you're paying that water bill to and sewer bill to, and find out what type of incentives they are offering and perhaps even encourage them to offer incentives. Um, for uh, replacing your your old water guzzling fixtures with more water efficient fixtures. Well, that's that's great information, so, Richard. That people can share with their clients. I like. Yeah, that. it it varies throughout the country, and we're we're seeing more and more of it in, in various markets where where they are incentivizing the the change out. So. Good. And Mary just wanted to comment. She said, um, "Great information," and that Thank she you, said Mary. she's in Montana is working toward conservation. So that's good to know. I love that. I love that. I'll have to uh, have to uh, make contact um, with you, Mary. My my email is rrossi at niagaracorp.com. R-R-O-S-S-I at niagaracorp.com. I'd love to learn more. You know, I, I can't get out and about as much as I used to. I cover all the Western U.S., but it's nice to know what's going on in various states as far as water conservation goes. Um, right. So I'd love to talk to you in more detail about that. Great. And I'll be sharing your email with everyone in my follow-up Thank you. email. So that's great. And I do have a few more questions. Are you still cool. okay? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. So, I love it. Okay, good. Christina um, says, I've heard that the technology exists to be even more water efficient and, and flush, but that the problem in North America is the size of the pipes in the sewer system. Is there any research into improving efficiency without having to upgrade the sewers everywhere? Yeah, that is <clears throat> that is part of the concern. Um, you know, the 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 lack of of uh, of infrastructure improvement in the plumbing systems. Um, I think there's a real movement towards that as there becomes a, a, you know there's becoming a more movement toward utilizing water conserving fixtures. Um, so I think we're going to see more and more of that. And what that's going to do, you know, in my my humble opinion here. <laughs> just my economics 101 logic, you know, eventually that is going to continue to raise the cost of water and sewer. Um, ultimately, when uh, plumbing is upgraded and the systems are upgraded that in your community that move water and sewer, ultimately the consumer will end up paying, you know, if not all of that cost, certainly a large portion of that cost. So I think we're seeing a trend toward that. And what that's going to continue to do is raise the cost of water and sewer. 
Um, so all that much more important to have water efficient fixtures in your homes to keep that keep that water bill as low as possible and and keep on those lower tiers of water use where you're not paying paying adders for using you know too much water in your home. So practicing water conservation in general, I mean the toilet fixture is is obviously the biggest user of water on average, but just practicing water conservation in general. I mean I I do things like you know I do, I shut the water off when I shave and uh, brush my teeth and things like that. I mean, even simple things like that can make a, make a big impact in the long run. Great. So keep, keep that in mind when you're running your sinks and stuff. So if you start thinking more about that, you start doing it. A lot of people like put like timers in their bathrooms for their showers and things like that to keep their showers at, you know, five minutes or less or whatever. Mm-hmm. So uh, every little thing we can do is it, it makes an impact down the road. Good. And I know Jim is uh, tuning in today from the Chicago area and he says, it's just a comment is called the drain line carry problem. Very yeah. clear. Yes. Yes. Drain line carry is interesting. One of the things I do want to point out about the technology that we talked about and concluded with today, the vacuum assist, which I, I know pretty darn well, um, the drain line carry is very significant on these toilets. It's, it's well past the IATMO uh, minimum of 40 feet. And IATMO, as I understand it, will test up to 60 feet. Um, these vacuum assist toilets, and um, I guess I can say the stealth toilet now, um, since we have Niagara up on the screen here, but um, they have a, a 55, high 50 feet, um, 55 to 60 feet line carry on the toilet. And you know what that does is it, it actually, the vacuum pulls the waste and the water from the bottom of the bowl and propels it down the drain lines a significant di- distance. So, as I mentioned on one of the earlier slides, the presence of additional long duration water flows in the building, in your home, are what's gonna to continue to move that solid waste and particulate matter down the drain lines. No toilet, even, if, even toilets that were used in seven gallons, were not meant to move all the waste, the solid waste down the drain lines. There's always gonna be particulate matter that's left behind. And that's those additional long duration water flows are gonna to continue to move that down the drain lines but um yeah blind carry is a, is definitely a um a concern with water conservation right because you got less water going into the uh you know going into the plumbing system to help move solid waste down the drain line so okay so i, I hope have, that answers your question i think so he he said good to know and um so i do have a few more are we still okay to keep going heck yeah are okay. you and if if holly has to draw, uh, jump off that's cool i i think i got it under control so yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so Anna says, if I have a two-piece toilet um, that's old and the tank is not working, could it be converted into uh, something sustainable by only changing the tank? Um, yeah, I would say with the technology that I talked about today, it cannot. Um, because of that movement of air and water between the trapway of the toilet, or the, I'm sorry, between, because of the air transfer tube, right, that connects to the vitreous china, you can't take one of these tanks and replace it on a regular toilet bowl. Most toilets will not have that additional connection, which is for the air transfer tube connected to the trapway of the toilet. So these toilets, the bowl and the tank work in conjunction with each other um, to save water. There, pardon me, there may be other types of water efficient technologies that you may be able to change out, you know, the tank for the bowl, the, the, the tank on the existing bowl. But the uh, vacuum assist or the stealth technology works with the vitreous china portion of the bowl um, that leads into the trapway. So that, so if you were to um, upgrade your toilet and renovate um, to a to a lower flow. You would change the bowl and the tank out together, because they work in conjunction with each other. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then Stephanie has another question here. She's saying, are the more efficient toilets that you've mentioned today, uh, not the gravity assist toilet, available in a wall mount toilet? Um, good question. The um, the uh, the vacuum assist toilet is not currently available in a wall mount unit. Um, one of the reasons is it's just difficult to be able to fit that unit in the wall um, that, that, you know, what would normally be your tank trim that's inside, which is called tank trim in the industry, the operating parts within the tank. Um, very difficult to get those in the, you know, depth of a wall. 
So the vacuum assist toilet is currently not available with a uh, with a wall mount, but there are other technologies uh, that I discussed today that are. So um, I'd encourage you to, you know, if you're looking for a for a wall mounted toilet, just investigate what's what's available on the market um, as far as technology in that toilet. Okay. And then Louise says, what is the average cost difference for a 0 0.08 GF toilet? Great question. I'm glad you asked that. A lot of people do ask about that because they think the technology in the toilet does, you know, require more money, right? Um, no, not necessarily. Matter of fact, the vacuum assist toilets are in many cases less expensive than higher flow toilets. Just depends on the make and model. Um, depends on a lot of different factors, you know, like, like I showed you that concealed trapway toilet, those toilets can be, you know, normally more expensive just because of the vitreous China that goes in them. Uh, but I would say comparing, you know, like a elongated single flush toilet, um, with, you know, a gravity uh, fed technology or, uh, or a, um, or any of the other technologies that I showed today, pressure assist, um, the vacuum assist technology is going to be very, very competitively priced um, with those technologies, if not even lower price in some cases. Okay, and then there's one thing that we didn't talk about today, or at least I didn't hear it being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are, uh, you know, residential um, homes as well as maybe some more commercial properties that don't use sewer lines, but they use like an enclosed. Um, system, septic systems type of thing. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so that may have some bearing on what kind of toilet a person can use in their home. Is that right? Uh, to some degree, I believe it does. I'm not fully knowledgeable about septic, but I will tell you that the 0.8 toilets work quite well in septic. And um, actually, you should not have to empty your septic system as frequently with a 0.8. So um, so yeah, I think I think there's some bearing that's involved there um, as far as septic versus sewer system. But um, I know that the uh, vacuum assist, the stealth toilets we've talked about today, the vacuum assist toilets are are used often in the um, in that type of uh, of sewer system as opposed to a, a regular plumbing system. Okay, great. Well, we've run out of questions, believe it or not. Cool. That's. <laughs> That's great. But I, I, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to thank you, Richard, and to Holly as well for, for all of this great information. And of course, to Gebert for sponsoring. And if there's yes. something else that you wanted to say, Richard? Um, no, I just, uh, I would encourage you guys, if, if you're interested in water conservation and not, you know, there's a lot of different type of folks out there, some homeowners, I'm sure, some designers, but I encourage you to look at the stealth technology as a possible solution and uh, to help your clients save water help save water for future generations, help cut costs. The other thing I think you're gonna find with these toilets, because they are flapperless, there's gonna be a, quite a, a maintenance reduction on the properties, whether it be in your home, and whether it be in a you know, multifamily property that's got hundreds of toilets on it. Um, the flapperless design does uh, uh, naturally provide less uh, you know, moving parts, less uh, requirement for maintenance. So. Um, as a matter of fact, in the last thing I'll throw in here, just to, to tout Niagara's warranty, um, the tank trim on the stealth toilets that we talked about today, the vacuum assist toilets, is 15 years from Niagara. Um, the callbacks we get on our toilets are so minimal that we've extended our warranty recently from 10 to 15 years. So it's, it's, it's probably the most solid warranty on the market as far as the tank trim goes. So any part that goes uh, that doesn't perform um, over that 15 year period, it's going to be replaced at Niagara's cost. So that's, that's pretty cool to know that. It really gives your clients, in, in, you know, yourself and your clients an assurance that this toilet is backed for, for the long term. That's great. And Anna says here that she's on her way to becoming a lead associate. So she really nice. appreciates the information today. And, cool. again, and again, I want to thank you, Richard. Thank our audience. Thank you, Holly, for being with us today. It's been a great session and it's thank been you. recorded. So, so everyone will get the recording as well. Thanks. That's, again. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you uh, for uh, hosting us. We really appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. Everybody have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye.